coming this evening. I'm actually quite impressed at our turnout given that it's a tube strike. Um, my name is Johanna and I'm the Talks Programmer at the Photographers Gallery. Um, and I'm very pleased this evening to introduce Paola Yacoube as part of this series about photography and the built environment, uh, which the Photographers Gallery is running in conjunction with the Architectural Association in our sort of interim year while we're refurbishing our building. Um, just a sort of housekeeping note, if you don't mind just turning off your mobile phones, um, it's not really just because they'll interrupt, but because they interfere with the sort of microphones and the levels. Um, so Paula studied at the Beirut Academy of Fine Arts and subsequently here at the Architectural Association, uh, graduating in 1993. She is a photographer and an artist, and in thinking about this series and the overlaps between photography and architecture, and what they share in particular, and distinctly from other forms such as painting. Uh, Paola's interest in the camera as a tool and what photography can be, can possibly be, immediately came to mind. Uh, this lecture, I think, I hope, and I know, will be a real treat, and I hope that you stay with us through the discussions about uh, chaos theory and skepticism. I know that they will reap great rewards for you at the end. Um, and of course, there'll be time for questions uh, as well. So I'm going to hand straight over to Paola. Thank you very much. OK. So I'll be reading a text and showing images. A vulgarization of nonlinear physics is becoming a commonplace in today's most dominant aesthetics. In the 80s and 90s, practices such as architecture, visual arts, and photography absorb codes of nonlinear processes such as flux theories, chaos theories, etc. This assimilation has effects today, social, aesthetical, etc. While drafting this speech, a friend of mine sent me a very recent article from the Financial Times entitled Chaos Theories, Lebanese Artists and Curators Offer Contrasting Responses to the country's conflicts. Today, studies are conducted on the social impact of industrialization, industrialization sorry, of nonlinear theories. Questions such as, how does the collection of statistical data shape our policies and everyday lives? Which type of subjects does it produce? How does it govern us? How can one use the resources of the law in relation to these creeping forms of normativity? But what is still at stake is to identify the effects of such platitudes in aesthetics. It just happens that it is here in this building that I started asking myself questions on these approaches. But in order to put light on the effects of these approaches in the cultural field, and to show its effect, for example, on the current Lebanese cultural situation, flash back with me with a very personal photographic experience made in the late 80s during the Civil War. It is an effect. I mean by effect, something happening to me without my wanting and pursuing me since the 90s in my architectural works as well as in my photographical works. I am every time worried 
about the construction of a building I design, and I'm every time worried about the photo I take. In fact, things happen to me as if, and here I quote from the experience by Emerson, if any of us knew what we were doing or where we are going, then we think we know best. And we may have the sphere for our cricket ball, but not a berry for our philosophy. Direct strokes nature never gave us power to make. All our blows blend, all our hits are accidents. Our relations to each other are oblique and casual. These two quotations always evoked for me my very early photographic experience. Trouble hunting my practice. It was in downtown Beirut in 1988, during the civil war, in the no man's land, the forbidden zone, with mines and snipers. I attended a press photo reporter equipped with my own camera. We scrutinized the zone, looking for danger and for potential events to capture. But this scrutinized gaze was tiring. To relax it, I let it float. I deviated it aside and forgot the shootings for a while. To the scrutinized gaze, a deviated gaze was subsidized. Under the stress, my gaze deviated, and what I shot without any aim came out unintentionally. Kurt Safransky theorized this deviated gaze in the after-war German press photography with what was known as subjective photography stressing out the importance of total personality. Now, for me, I do not know what I am doing and I do not know what I will have on these photographs. Whatever I will have on these photographs is not intended. Ignorance is inherent to the structure of photography. Here, I quote Stanley Cavell, you cannot know what you have made the camera do, what is revealed to you, until its results have appeared. That the mysteriousness of the photograph lies not in the machinery which produces it, but in the abyss between what it captures its subject and what is captured for us, this fixing of the subject, the metaphysical weight between exposure and exhibition, the absolute authority or finality of the fixed image. For Stanley Cavell, automatism is not only a mean for artistic experience, but is part of it encoding it, letting it emerge by itself. Whether I like it or not, I discover a photograph I have done only when it's in front of me. Now, a photograph is a world by itself. The camera is not part of it. This photograph of Mrs. Elizabeth Hall, shot by Hill and Adamson, was interpreted by Walter Benjamin as following. The fishmonger from New Haven, looking down to the ground with modesty and so seductive. But according to Andre Gunther, this interpretation is misleading. Walter Benjamin described this photograph as if it was a snapshot, but it was not a snapshot. In fact, this is a portrait by Hill and Adamson for which Mrs. Elizabeth Hall stood for long seconds. Her eyes blinked several times during the exposure. 
it is almost impossible to tell if her eyes are open, closed, or looking down. The camera, with its time exposures, remained outside of the world of this figure. The impression of the eyes looking down belongs to the world of this picture, a world open to all kinds of interpretations. There is a split between I do something and I get something else not related. In order to clarify between different emergences at stake and to better understand our relation to automatism, I suggest to you a provisional typology divided as such. I will come back to this classification with illustrated examples and to the relationship we build with automatas with self-operating machines. And this regardless of any chronological order. Continuous automatism, I do something and I get something else, but I deny it, I ignore the gap. Realistic automatism, I do something and I get something else. Here, I endlessly explore the results. Maintained automatism, I don't interfere in it. I don't attempt to make any profit. Co-opted automatism, I seek for a profit and for an appropriation of results, such as form productions, situations, and even knowledge. The idea of classification is borrowed from Marcel Duchamp's ready-mades. He proposed a classification as following. The pure ready-made, the fountain, the assisted ready-made, the artist adding moustaches to Mona Lisa, the reciprocal ready-made taking a Rembrandt and using it as an iron board. But these categories cannot be transplanted as such today. Our relation to automatas has a historicity very different from those relevant today. I will start with the first example. In the foreground of this photograph by Jeff Wall, inside the architecture of Ms. Van der Rohe, a pillar having a cross shape. The housekeeper is in the back. And water drops are on the rear windows. Jeff Wall suggests a discontinuity between the making of this photograph and what one sees. I mean that Jeff Wall plays in establishing an ambivalence on the automation of this photograph. But on the other hand, paradoxically, there is another level on which Jeff Wall insists, denying this discontinuity and suggesting to us to pay attention to the water drops that might dirty the rear windows. In fact, do water drops on a glass evoke something special to you? water on glass plates. The reference is explicit, even obsessive. It is a reference to the photographic liquid emulsion used on glass plates in photography. Liquids are a continuum thread in this process, from the invisible to the shooting, to what one sees on the windows, and to what one sees on the photograph itself. There are some examples for continuous automatism, crystals, for example. From nature to drawings, photographs, the form is directly taken. One can find them on the cover of the Bauhaus magazines. For Rudolf Steiner, gems are secret instruments with which angels perceive.
Another approach to automated photography is characterized by an endless expansion of the work. A jet never stopped activating automatas. If there were no passers-by or people in his photographs, it is not because he avoided them, but rather because they were simply not fixed by the mechanism of his camera. They were automatically deleted or they left a very subtle trace on the plate because one needed several minutes of exposure before having an impression. A jet could have also avoided the burned edges on the corners of this photograph on your left hand side by simply changing his device. The visible expression of the optical mechanism did not bother him. The split between what he photographed and what appeared on the photograph was very much accepted by him. A jet also collaged or mounted different automats onto each other, one after the other. For example, the entropy of ruined buildings will be systematically photographed. He was passionate about fortifications, soon meant to be destroyed, outweighing men themselves, destructing their trades and demolishing their neighborhoods. Sometimes plants will disrupt the apparatus of the stones. A jet captured these roots plants that blow up walls. Now here to your right hand side corner, a photograph of a natural disaster by Mubridge following the San Francisco earthquake in 1868. In fact, one can consider all automats to be compatible with each other, all combinations possible, all developments appropriate. Not one criterion can stop these processes. This endless expansion is realistic. Transition between two automatis is sometimes more important than one automatis. But what would then be the specificity of photography if all automats are compatible? When Courbet painted the marines, he exhibited the marines. There is no rupture between his program of painting the marines and the result of painting the marines. But when Ajet made landscape and documents, he exhibited Paris and his fortifications. He set for himself a clear working program. He classified his photographs in albums, but those albums differ from his program. It seems obvious today, but it was not. Here is the program of work. Landscape documents, Vieille France, picturesque Paris, art in old Paris. And here is the list of the albums, landscape documents, vehicles, zones, art in old Paris. Machines can be kept sterile unproductive. We do not seek to exploit the machine in order to get a result. Marcel Duchamp tries always to involve himself in their mechanisms without diverting them. To achieve this multiple self-portrait in 1917 by means of a device made out of a prism of mirrors, he literally placed himself inside the automata. His portrait was then multiplied. To your right hand side, another self portrait by Witkevich from 1915. Here, the mirror prism is shown, destructing the illusion of multiplicity. Witkevich chose to show us the optical automat. Now back to Duchamp, to your left-hand side, with his nine Malik Smalls, subtitled Matrice de Ross. 
these molds are cast for making uniforms. Duchamp suggests using them as an analogy to photographic negatives. I quote him. By molds, one means in terms of forms and colors, the photographic negative. Duchamp will also involve himself in the very conditions of chaos. The box notes from 1934 specifically address the technical aspect of early chaos theory first developed by Henri Poincaré, who died in 1912. Poincaré stated that chance systems sensitive to small initial conditions like the weather or roulette are affected by air currents, muscle control, and gravity. In the green box, note, Duchamp refers to the same three initial conditions that Poincaré has mentioned. For his three experiments in chance, Duchamp writes, wind for the draft pistons, skill for the holes, weight for the standard stop. Co-opting automatism in order to gain profit, such as simple form production, took place way before surrealism as early as the emergence of optical devices in photography. Here is an example, an echo to romanticism. Do you know the celestographs of Steinberg? They are dated from 1894. I quote, the celestographs were produced by an even more direct method, using neither lens nor camera. The experiment involved quite simply placing his photographic plates on a windowsill, or perhaps directly on the ground, sometimes, he tells us, already lying in the developing bath, and letting them be exposed to the starry sky. But that's not all. Strandberg introduced an idea that revitalized the entire device. The black or darkly earth-colored pictures that eventually appeared are strewn with a myriad of small, lighter dots that Strandberg thought were stars. That they might have been drops of dew, some kind of atmospheric particles, or just some dirt in the developer cannot be ruled out. As soon as the experiments were finished, Strindberg sent both photographs and a written account to the famous astronomer Camille Flammarion in Paris. But Strindberg never received the official recognition for which he was yearning. In fact, Strindberg did not limit himself to the simple activation of automatism. He co-opted even the cosmos. In natural destruction, one cannot take account of how it is chaotic. It is obvious that it is almost impossible to directly control the involved forces. Here, are two works by Robert Smithson. I quote, defending himself against allegations that he and other earth artists cut and gouged the land like army engineers, Smithson, in his own essay, charges that one of such opinions failed to recognize the possibility of a direct organic manipulation of the land. Robert Smithson recognizes the autonomy of chaotic processes and tries to take advantage of them, co-opting them. In his photographic series, to your left-hand side, in the city of Passaic, New Jersey, industrial buildings are exposed to climate. Smithson raises them to the status of monuments to their entropy. In his other photographic series from 1969 to your right-hand right side, a hotel in Mexico 
where one cannot decide on what he sees in the photograph. The hotel is both in construction, in renovation, and in destruction. This photograph belongs to a slideshow of 31 slides that Smithson made for a seminar in architecture at the University of Utah. The number of slides is limited. The slideshow is demonstrative. The uncertainty about the status of the hotel is co-opted, exploited. A romantic option is underlined. Stanley Cavell distinguishes between past romanticism, evoking malefic or benefactory powers of nature, and a contemporary romanticism acknowledging the autonomy of nature. But the position of the subject in relation to nature is determined either in a frontal position or from a nigh bird point of view. Spiral jetty by Smithson was visible only from helicopter, referring to the aerial views paintings by Malevich. Co-opting automatism has touched upon several other practices, military strategies too. The co-optation of natural forces can be very useful, and this is often the case in architecture. But here is a special example of the use of nonlinear physics in the Iraq war. I refer to Creative Destruction by Ryan O'Kane from 2006. Concepts such as liberating cows and harnessing cows are mentioned. I quote him. Cows planning is an iterative and interactive process involving the modeling of desirable scenarios against which actions and reactions can be evaluated and directed through a series of short-term predictions towards the most likely scenario. In some ways, military strategy has always recognized the chaotic nature of war. Modern chaos strategies. What is new, however, is the acceptance that chaos may not be so easily crushed and may in fact be creative. What is amazing in this picture to your left hand side is the helio heliocentric model implemented. A sun surrounded by planets worthy of Copernicus. But is it, it is precisely this model that brought into question earlier works on chaos. Chaos theory was born, among other things, and to a large extent, around the issue of stability of the solar system. Poincaré picked up the problem and studied the movement of three gravitational interaction bodies, such as the sun, the earth, the moon, and had shown that the future of this system cannot be predicted. Now this outdated reversible linear model is paradoxically still in use today, illustrating the application of chaos theories. In fact, it's about the gaze, the overlooking gaze that only old cosmological models could provide. And co-optation implies an overlooking synoptic gaze. I come back to the photographs of downtown Beirut. There is another way of co-opting cows is to take advantage of their cultural implications. Lebanon is a perfect example. Lebanese political leaders, actors of the civil war, are experts in chaos co-optation, imposing a cultural norm, skepticism. These photographs in downtown Beirut reflect a kind of suspended gaze in the process of actually taking the photographs. I refuse granting them any kind of documentary. Put 
everything in doubt, ask Robert Smithson. Skepticism in photography is not new. But still, in front of these photographs, we still don't know who are the authors and what are the reasons for this destruction. One could have simply asked the owners of Hotel Palanque in Mexico, in the case of Robert of Smithson photographic series, if the hotel was under construction, renovation, or destruction. In Beirut, it is agreed that one cannot know but agreed by whom and why, who did it, is never at stake in Lebanese artistic practices. 20 years later, politicians still conceal documents on atrocities they committed, imposing a diffuse skepticism in media and in culture and contemporary art, hence the amnesty law of 1991. It is agreed that we would not know who destroyed the city center. Obviously, a lot of people do know exactly who did what, but everyone is compelled to doubt. This denial of historical investigation is common to many post-war situations in the world. But the Lebanese specificity lies elsewhere, in the annexation of cultural production to this strategy. Visual art will contribute in deterring documentary works, fictionalizing documents, etc. The war even becomes a catastrophe, a metaphysical disaster by itself. In this collision between cultural practices and a ruling caste that the Lebanese exception is situated, it shows how one could insidiously slip from, we do not know what we are doing, to the prohibition of knowing what we are doing. Thank you. There's a, a lot to unpack there, I think. Um, and I think, I mean, are there any immediate questions from the audience there? I mean, from my, from my understanding, a little bit of it, it's, it's, it's a possibility of dealing with this situation, of dealing with, these, um, with your own work, of um, trying to get away from this sort of co-opting gaze, this singular overarching gaze, and this possibility of a sort of non-linearity of looking at the situation. So it's a sort of using this sort of idea to be able to not just deal with the aestheticization of it, or, or not the, but the aesthetics within it, but also the politics within it somehow. Is that not? <laughs> yeah. I mean, yes, you can. Is that, do you think that's enough? Yeah, that's too long for me. Not really. <laughs> Uh, I'm not an architect, and a lot of what you said I, I, I didn't entirely follow, but I'm very interested more for reasons of philosophy, I think, than architecture, and what you were saying about co-opting this notion of chaos. Because in a sense, it, the idea that you can co-opt something that is understood as a chaotic system kind of proposes that the person who is creative, the photographer, the artist, the perceiver, is in somehow inhabiting some other place and in thinking about chaos theory there's a real tension between people who think of chaos theory systemically and people who think more in terms of process and clearly if you think about self-organizing systems in terms of process there isn't a juxtaposition so you're not in that sense co-opting something that is outside the moment that you're present in the creative act does that make some sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you for the question. I mean, well, I've, I've tried to cl classify. I mean, this. I mean, I did not really talk about my attitude uh, towards this, but I tried to show the processes of an artist, architect, whoever is producing, what he is in front of. You know, like the consequences of it. 
and co-optation you know, is the most fashionable, popular now, uh, one today, like letting the system work and then taking a benefit out of it. So I showed it in the Iraq war, I showed it in the Lebanese situation, and I showed it in Smithson, but I'm, I, it's not taking a judgment. I mean, I was, I'm interested in the gap which, which is between what do I do? I do something and I get something else. So, I mean, what you said is, is one part of it, but I thank you for the question. It's really the same. It's Yes. And and the in a sense the fantasy of control that is so present in the, in the political debate that I think you're also yes. pointing to, which is fundamental to the kind of creativity yes. that you're drawing attention to. Yes, it's exactly my position. So again, thank you for the question. I think there is a dynamical system that we think we control. But I just wanted to say that since Point Carré we know we can't control chaos. Uh, it's amazing how artists, architects, politicians will just ignore what's, in a way, what's at stake, so. I, I have to ask the slightly obvious question, which is how your view of, um, of this situation um, differs, perhaps, from the view of other Lebanese artists um, and representations, I suppose, contemporary? I mean, for, for the moment, I think it's like I'm born in the same scene, but there are differences, like Bataille was different to yeah. the others, so I think there are things in common and things which are not in common. What, I try, what I'm trying to say in the Lebanese situation, that which, I, which I'm naming as skepticism, is like skepticism is being used by, pol there is an immersion, there is a collaboration, collision between the uh, Lebanese art scene and the political, like about documents, uh, like there's no access to documents in a way, however you turn it. So my, so, and then of course, I mean, but I'm not interested in, a, in the debate of what is a document. Or I mean, it's a long subject. I don't know how to answer it. I mean, I tried to, I tried to introduce subjectivity, which is almost impossible in, in such a situation. Um, I, I was interested about um, the relationship between your photographic work, I suppose, and um, the, the photographic um, taking photographs as an, an act almost that you depict afterwards. Um, it, it seems, or, um, what you seem to imply was that the, the act of taking photographs um, for you was somewhat chaotic in the sense that you, you kind of went out and you didn't necessarily know what you were taking photographs of and it was only through the distance of time and the print that um, the, uh, your, your intentionality became clear. Um, is, is that true or is it's, it? It's almost true except for the last word. Not There's no intention. There's no intention? No, even later. It's just, you know, like. Uh, so, so you believe that, um, or, or rather, I suppose, because you, you referred to Jeff Wall, and I'm kind of thinking about you know, the, the debates that came out of you know, the staged and the document, whatever. And I'm thinking, do you, do you believe that um, photographs are made or taken in that respect? Yeah, I, I, I'm stating that I do something. I think I know what I'm doing, but in fact, I don't know what I'm doing. And therefore, I say there's no intention. I say there's no, it's not really in a documentary practice. Like, I don't document. These photos show nothing, tells you nothing absolutely about Beirut. I mean, except for the crippled walls, you know, so. So is, it a, is the kind of context of them a red herring then? I mean, it's just um, what the viewer gains from them in terms of kind of like a visceral experience. I mean, uh, what, what do you want the viewer to read from your images, I suppose? It's open, uh, I mean, it's open to you. I mean, it's, it's a very good question because I think I, uh, 
the interpretation of the gaze is very different. It's again something else. You know, like you do something, you get something else, and then you get many interpretations. Like I could interpret, and I did in fact, change the context of these photographs many times. So there is a difference for me between what I do and what I get. And what I get is, uh, is language, of course, yeah? Then I'm dealing with language. Whatever you're looking at, what you see, it's all you know, open to interpretation. I just wanted to say, because you were talking a lot about Duchamp, would you relate your work to uh, André Breton's manifesto on surrealism, and especially uh, when he's talking about objet trouvé, convulsive beauty, and explosion fix? It's related to automatism. Have you came across this text already? And have you okay. No, I, I didn't. Uh, I didn't use Breton at all in okay. this. I was just trying to trying to be uh, to look only on on automatism. You know, it's 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 true because I mean here I say different. Yeah, I uh, with uh, with all the surrealists. If I take the example of Ajet, like they changed the context of Ajet's work. I mean, I looked at them, but not at what you were saying. Like it became like if you take the photos of Ajet of the empty streets, then you can say uh, there were lots of literature about them saying that there are ghosts in the pictures. So I did not want to go in the literature of the surrealist. I wanted to stop at the automatism that functions for Ajit. I was thinking about um, this uh, Ulrich Bayer book on trauma and photography, and photography as being something um, which is just, just as much about what you can't represent as what you can represent. And I wondered if, you know, the, the photographs, you, you mentioned that the photographs that you've taken don't really say anything specific about the political um, events in Beirut. And I just wondered, you know, with this, with this issue of intention, whether there was a relationship between trauma and the mode of expression for you. And more than? So the mode of expression, the way of expressing that kind of, um, the way of expressing, the way of expressing the inexpressible, the relationship between trauma and photography. It's, it's a good and a maybe difficult question in a way because I'm, I've put this problem in the process, not in the result. Because when I start looking at what I see, for me, I fall into language. So your question is very true because it is done with a trauma uh, effect. Uh, I was young, it was war, I was an assistant of a photo reporter, but I put this automatism, if I can say, no, I'm not co-opting it, but uh, it's in the process uh, um, you know, part. But it is true, of course. It's There's so much there to sort of mine and to perhaps um, take away. And of course, you know, um, for those that want to listen to this again, because I think there is a lot of there's a lot of sort of dense information in this. Then you know, it will be on the on the AA website, and we can sort of mull it over. Because I think that there's a, a lot there which is particularly interesting to photography, and which doesn't normally get discussed within photography. It's sort of outside of the normal spheres and realms. Um, so I think probably at that stage, I'm not sure how far feels, we will, we'll, maybe we'll pour it to, to an end. Um, and thank you all and thank you very much for having us. Thank you very much. Thank you.